So my name is Laurent Bopp. I work at the Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement near Paris in France. I'm a specialist of the ocean carbon cycle. I was part of the last IPCC report as a lead author of the last carbon chapter and I will present today a talk about the carbon cycle, its components and its coupling with the climate system. And good morning everybody. So I will be talking about the carbon cycle today and its coupling with the climate system. So you've been seeing some of the graphs I will show in this talk. Uh, some of them presented by Thomas Stoker on, on the first day. Uh, some of them presented by, uh, uh, by the last speakers today even. But we'll try to go a little bit more into details, into the mechanics of the carbon cycle. Uh, so the, the sources of my presentation are twofold. First, I will use lots of figures of the last IPCC report, and especially of the, one of the 14 chapters that Thomas presented the first day of the gift workshop. I will use figures from the carbon cycle chapter, which is uh, uh, authored by Sier and, and 15 other uh, co-authors. That's one source for my presentation. And then the other source that, that I will be using heavily in the first part of the presentation comes from an international project that is called the Global Carbon Project. And this project, every year, releases an annual update of the global carbon cycle, of the global carbon budget. So I will be using figures and numbers from the uh, 2013 carbon budget. And you'll see that in the first slides of my presentation. Uh, so as any, as most of the carbon cycle uh, presentations, I start with this very famous curve. That's the Killing Curve that uh, Thomas Stoker also presented the first day. So it's called the Killing Curve because it's Charles Killing, an American scientist that was the first to set up this uh, observatory in Mauna Loa, measuring directly CO2 in the atmosphere. That's why it's called the, the Killing Curve. And so you have this only long time series from 1958, uh, when atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa was recorded at 315 ppm to today here, 2013, uh, uh, year at which Mauna Loa, uh, uh, CO2 in Mauna Loa was recorded at 396.5 ppm. That's the annual mean. And so that's an increase of almost 30% in 50 years. So that's the Mauna Loa curve. If you zoom over the last years, and it's a very special week for the carbon community, because if you zoom about the last few weeks and the last year here, you have uh, the Mauna Loa record from May 2013 to April 2014, and you see the nice seasonal cycle that is driven by the respiration and photosynthesis of the land biosphere. But what you see here is that for the first time in humankind, if you want, we have at Mauna Loa atmospheric CO2 above 400 ppm. So that's a, like a symbolic threshold, if you want but it's above 400 ppm for four consecutive weeks. So it's the first month since the start of this record that we have atmospheric CO2 monthly mean above 400 ppm. So that depicts this huge rise in atmospheric CO2 that we record in Mauna Loa. Uh, that's an island in, in Hawaii. So basically what I will be doing in the coming minutes is explaining this curve. Why is CO2 increasing? And trying to finally go into the details of the mechanics of the carbon cycle. So the outline of this presentation is, is the following. I have three steps. The first step is going into the global carbon budget. I've been showing delta CO2 on the left side of this equation, this very simple equation. That's what you've seen from the Mauna Loa record, increasing in atmospheric CO2. And we'll try to explain this increase with three components, the anthropogenic emissions first, and you'll see that's what I will demonstrate in this first part, that you need other terms to be explained to close the carbon budget. You need a carbon sink to the ocean, and you need a carbon sink to the land biosphere. I will explain that in the first part of this talk. Then in the second part, I will focus on these carbon sinks, giving you a bit more details on the mechanisms that explain why the ocean is taking up carbon today, why the land biosphere is also taking up carbon today. What are the processes, what are the regions important for these carbon sinks, natural carbon sinks? And then in the last part, I will show you that these sinks of carbon to the ocean and to the land biosphere are influenced by climate, by climate variability and by climate change. And if it's, the, if it's the, the case that these things are influenced by climate, then you have a retraction in the climate system. CO2 is changing climate, which is changing the things, which in fact retroact on atmospheric CO2. And so you have positive or negative retraction in the system, and we'll be talking about that in the last part. So that's the three simple uh, steps that I want to follow now 
in the coming uh, minutes. So let's start with this global carbon budget. I've been showing a little bit about delta CO2 in Mauna Loa. Now we'll focus on emissions, which are causing this increase of CO2, as Thomas said the first day, of course, and as you all know. So emissions, you've seen this curve. Those are uh, human-driven fossil fuel emissions caused by the combustion of fossil fuel, coal, oil, natural gas. And you see this increase of emissions from the 90s to 2013 here, uh, and you even see an acceleration of emissions at the end of the 90s decades. So the rate of uh, CO2 emissions increase was 1% uh, during the 90s, and it's almost 3% over the last decade. And so we are reaching now almost 10 gigaton of carbon. So gigaton of carbon, that's billion tons of carbon here in 2013, uh, which is much more than the previous years. You see here the, the 28 financial crisis. And in terms of CO2 emissions, they have recovered very quickly after the crisis, much quicker than many, many other things. Um, and so almost 10 gigaton of carbon. So that's something that uh, Thomas showed the first day. So now we can go a little bit more into details into these, these emissions. The first thing that we can do is to uh, decompose these emissions into coal, oil, gas, cement production, and flaring here. And what you see is that in the, 60, in the 60s, oil uh, uh, consumption and oil or emissions due to oil consumption was the, the first driver of these uh, emissions. And over the last 15 years now, it's coal that is increasing a lot. So we've been shifting again from first coal to oil and now from oil to coal as the main driver in terms of combustion. So the, the different shares are changing in the CO2 emissions. That's first, the first way to look at these emissions. Now, we can also decompose the emissions by countries or by regions of the world. And you see here the emissions still in, in billions of tons of carbon per year here. And that's the sum of all emissions. And you have different countries or different regions of the world. The USA here, EU28, Russia, China, India. And so you see the different contributions of the different countries. And you see also the dynamics of these emissions. You see stabilization in EU or in the United States of America, and you see this big increase in China over the, last, over the last decades. So that's one way to look at the emissions decomposed by countries. There is another way to decompose by country. You can integrate the emissions. As Thomas said the first day, what's, what matters the most, it's not the actual emissions, it's the integrated, the cumulative emissions. You integrate them from the start of the industrial period. And if you do that, you get some, of course, different numbers. And that's what you see here. So that's a breakdown by country for historical cumulative emissions. So we've integrated these gigaton of carbon per year. So now it's gigaton, and we look at the relative contribution. And you see here, at the end of the, of the 90th century, it's mostly uh, EU countries, plus a little bit of the, of the US. And then, uh, of course, if you look at the last decades, you have a big increase from the rest of the world, China and a little bit of India here, and a, a decrease of USA. But still today, you have something like a bit more than 25% from the US, maybe similar from EU 28, and the rest from the rest of the world. So it's a very different view of emissions from the different countries if you decompose using the cumulative emissions of if you look at the today's emissions. Another way to look at the emissions still uh, is to compare them to scenarios. And here, we've been coming uh, back to these scenarios at the end of the talk. You have the RCP scenarios, representative concentrations, pathways that have been used also in the previous talk uh, to look at sea level rise. And here you have a comparison. So these scenarios, they start in 25. And already in 2010, 2015, they diverge. And you see here that we can compare in 2013 the CO2 emissions in billions of tons of carbon to the different scenarios. And you see that we're following, we're on the path of the business as usual scenario, RCP 8.5, and not on the path of the more optimistic scenarios, like RCP 2.6. So that's another way to look at the emissions. And in fact, the, the high, the acceleration here, uh, almost 3% per year, uh, puts us on the path of this high emission scenario. Uh, maybe a good, new, good news here. Uh, sometimes it's good to look at that also. You have the fossil fuel emissions here with the acceleration uh, over the last 15 years, and it's compared to the deforestation emissions. So that's the other part of the human-driven emissions. 
emissions from land use changes, deforestation in the world. And what you see here is that in the beginning of the 60s, these land use estimated carbon emissions were accounting for almost 40% of total human-driven emissions. And they have been decreasing over the past decades. And now they amount to maybe less than one, petrogram, one gigaton of carbon per year. So it's only 10% or less than 10% of the fossil fuel emissions. So deforestation emissions are decreasing slightly and fossil fuel emissions are increasing uh, very rapidly. So now it's, uh, if you do the sum in 2012, it's more than 10 gigaton of carbon per year. If you sum this one gigaton of carbon from the land use plus the almost 10 from the fossil fuel emissions. So that's a very brief description of emissions, countries, coal, oil, uh, land use, and, and, uh, and fossil fuel. If you want more details about emissions, I suggest that you look at this website that has been put together by the Global Carbon Project. It's called the Global Carbon Atlas. And you have three sections. So there is this website that is very well, uh, that is very useful. Three sections, you have an outreach section in which you have a few uh, description of the mechanics of the carbon cycle. And you have also these sections on emissions which enable you to explore and download global and country level carbon emissions. So you can play with those numbers by countries, by coil, all of a different periods. You can download the numbers, you can plot them, so you can really play and do all the graphs that I've showed you. So that's the Global Carbon Atlas. Okay, so we've been talking about emissions. Now we'll try to compare emissions and atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So that's the first step in this Global Carbon Budget. Delta CO2 on one side and then the emissions on the other side. So if you want to compare those two numbers, so these two curves basically, CO2 emissions in billion tons of carbon here on, on the left side and on the right side you have CO2 concentrations in ppm. So parts per million, that's a ratio of the volume occupied by CO2 molecules compared to the volume of, of the air. Uh, and so you need, if you want to compare those two numbers, you need to convert somehow billions of tons of carbon to some ppm values. And so the, the magic number that is used in the carbon cycle community is this one, 2.12. Uh, and basically, an increase of 1 ppm V of CO2 in the atmosphere is equivalent to an addition of 2.12 gigaton of carbon per year. And so then you're able to say, okay, I put 10 gigaton of carbon per year in the atmosphere. Atmospheric CO2 should increase by something like 5 ppm to account for this addition of carbon. You have other units here. Gigaton of carbon, that's billion tons of carbon. Sometimes it's expressed in gram, 10 to the 15th. If you keep it in gram, it's petagram of carbon here. It's always the same. And then sometimes it's also expressed in, in the mass of CO2. So you have to account for the mass of the oxygen atoms. So all this is the same. And one ppm would be equivalent to all these numbers here. So now the next graph is maybe one of the most important graphs in the carbon cycle science. It's the comparison between emissions here in a gigaton of carbon per year and the atmospheric growth rate, which has been converted from ppm per year to gigaton of carbon per year. So then you can put the two on the same graph. And so this curve is basically just the derivative of the atmospheric CO2 concentration. So it's a dCO2 over dt, gigaton of carbon per year. And so you can compare the two numbers, uh, total emissions here and the atmospheric growth rate. And we can make two very strong conclusions from this, this very simple comparison. First conclusion is the following. Atmospheric growth rate is less than 50% of total emissions. So it means that only half of the CO2 that has been emitted by humans accumulates in the atmosphere. The other half goes somewhere else because atmospheric growth rate is less than the total emissions. So you need other terms in my simple equations, delta CO2 equal emissions, to account for this uh, reduction. And, the other, and these other terms we'll be focusing on then later are sinks to the ocean and to the land. So emissions, it's twice as much as delta CO2. That's what you see here. And the other big conclusion we can make from this simple figure is the following. Uh, the atmospheric growth rate is much more variable than total emissions. So something is happening in the system, in the climate system, or in the carbon cycle system, that will drive variability in the atmospheric growth rate that is not coming from total emissions. So some years, CO2 grows very fast, almost 
100% compared to total emissions. And some years, uh, CO2 grows very slowly, maybe only 10, 20% of the total emissions. So something in the climate system is, playing, is at play here to explain why CO2 growth rates are varying at very different levels depending on the years. Okay, so let's come back on these equations here. Delta CO2 equal emissions minus potentially two things, one to the ocean and one to the land biosphere. And if you use only uh, these numbers that we know very well from Mauna Loa, but also from other atmospheric stations and the emissions that I've been describing, we know them very well also from statistics from the different countries and regions of the world. You have one, one problem here. You have only one equation, which is the carbon budget. And you have two unknowns, the sink to the ocean and the sink to the land biosphere. And of course, you can't, you can't solve this equation with two unknowns and one equation. And it's, in fact, it's very important to know where the carbon is going. Is it in the ocean or is it in the land biosphere? Because if you want to be able to project the evolution of the system, you need to know, to build models, for example, you need to know where it's going now. So you need additional information to be able to solve this system. Where is carbon is going? To the ocean or to the land? And that's very important to constrain the system. So there are many ways to constrain this system. I will show one, one example, very elegant way to constrain this system that has been put together by the son of Charles Killing that I was mentioning in the beginning of my talk, whose name is uh, Ralph Killing, also working at Scripps in the US. And uh, this uh, elegant way is based on oxygen. And this has been uh, quickly described by Thomas Brunier the, the first day. So I, I go a little bit into more details here to explain how it works. Why you can use another tracer, oxygen, to decompose the carbon fluxes to the ocean and to the land biosphere. So basically what we add here is another source of information that is coming from the decrease of oxygen in the atmosphere. So you see here at Mauna Loa and South Pole increase of atmospheric CO2. And you see here, at the same time, measured only from the start of the 90s, it's much more difficult to measure changes in atmospheric oxygen because you measure very little change compared to a huge reservoir. But now we are able to do so. So you see this decrease of oxygen uh, at Cape Grim and Alert, Alaska and Cape Grim in the southern hemisphere that is uh, opposite to the increase of CO2. So the main reason for the decrease of oxygen is because we burn fossil fuel. So when you burn coal and oil, you consume oxygen. So that's, that's explaining this decrease of O2. And in fact, we can use this decrease as an additional constraint for the carbon budget because you have links between CO2 emitted from fossil fuel combustion and O2 consumed for the same combustion processes. And we know, we know the stoichiometric ratio here. It's about 1.4. So for one mole of CO2 that is emitted, you will consume 1.4 mole of oxygen. That's what you need to burn methane, oil, and coal. We can compute an average and get the stoichiometric ratio. And for the land sink, we know that the land sink is due to photosynthesis of respiration. And so any CO2 that is exchanged by the land will have an oxygen counterpart with a stoichiometric ratio that is close to 1, maybe a bit less than 1.1. That is the stoichiometric ratio for photosynthesis and respiration. So you know these beta and these alpha terms. And for the ocean, I will explain later, but the CO2 sink to the ocean does not imply any oxygen exchanges. So there's no oxygen exchanged by the ocean parallel to the CO2 sink. So you, can, you don't have a third term in this equation. And then you have a system of two equations. You know delta CO2 and delta O2 that you measure in the atmosphere. You know the emissions. You know alpha and beta. And then you can solve this system and you get the carbon sink to the land and the carbon sink to the ocean. So that's a very elegant way of decomposing, of solving the carbon budget. So now we combine this uh, oxygen CO2 method with other methods. But I will, what I will show you now is the global carbon budget that we obtain from this method and also from other methods. Uh, so you have, so that's the budget for the last 10 years, uh, 23, 2012 here, also coming from the Global Carbon Project, uh, 2013 annual budget. So you have emissions from fossil fuel combustion, almost 9 gigaton of carbon per year, 90% of the emissions. You have emissions from uh, deforestations, less than one, so less than 10% of the emissions. And then you have the right terms of my equations, what stays in the atmosphere, it's a bit less than 50%. That is causing global warming. And what is going into the ocean here and into the land biosphere? And you see that it's about half and half. Uh, 
20% of the total emissions goes into the ocean, 2.6 gigaton of carbon per year, and the rest is going in the land biosphere. So both components, the ocean and the land biosphere, are equally important for today's carbon budgets. So if you want to project the evolution of CO2 in the atmosphere, you need to know what will happen with the ocean carbon sink and what will happen with the land carbon sink. So this is very important. Uh, one point here, in the next talk, you'll be hearing about ocean acidification. And that's directly caused by the fact that this CO2 is entering the ocean. It's a weak acid and it will cause ocean acidification. But Jim Orr will uh, come back to that in much more details later. That's another way to look at the global carbon budget. This time, a dynamical way over 1750 to 2012. So you see the same terms. Positive here, that those are the sources of carbon to the atmosphere, and that's the sink of carbon. Uh, so you have fossil fuel emissions and cement production, deforestation here, and you have the sink in the land biosphere, what stays in the atmosphere, and the sink in the ocean. And we've been able, using both the methods that I was describing before, but also models, to uh, go back in the past and uh, basically draw a picture of this global carbon budget over the last 250 years. And you see this evolution of first only deforestation, mostly an ocean sink here, and then a land sink, and the increase of fossil fuel emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So we have now a clear picture of the global carbon budget over the industrial era. So this is at the global scale. Now we'll try to go into more regional scale, and we'll look at the land sink and at the ocean sink. So let's go a bit more regional. That's the second steps in my uh, three-step outline. First, if you want to go regional, so this O2 method, for example, it gives you a global number. But you don't know where the CO2 is going. Is it going in the North Atlantic or is it going in the Equatorial Pacific? And for the ocean, for example, if you want to be able to project, you need to know where the CO2 is going. You need to know to understand why the CO2 is going into the ocean. So for the ocean, we have some information. So I will be quite brief here, but we have some information that comes from direct measurements or observations at the RC interface. So we are able to measure the partial pressure of CO2 in the seawater and above seawater in the air. And if you know the difference in partial sea pressure, that's the delta PCO2 that is written here, that the difference between the PCO2 in the sea and PCO2 in the air, we're able to reconstruct an uh, exchange coefficient. And the product of this exchange coefficient times this delta PCO2 gives you the flux. So we have more than now 10 millions of measurements of this delta PCO2 thanks to uh, scientific cruisers. I know we have also some commercial ships that are equipped and that are able to measure PCO2 in the water uh, on, on, uh, on trips from, for example, Europe to the USA here. So in some regions of the world, we have lots of lots of measurements. So with all these measurements, we are able to interpolate or extrapolate them and to get those kind of maps, which is a map of the RC carbon flux here for year 2000. So it's a climatology map. And what you see from this map is that you have regions in blue and purple here that are carbon sink regions, but you have also large regions of the world ocean in red and yellow that are carbon sources regions. So even if CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, you have regions in which CO2 is entering the ocean and regions in which CO2 is exiting the ocean. So you see that the ocean carbon cycle is complicated. We have to understand what's happening in the ocean carbon cycle to be able to explain the carbon sink. But we have these methods and we have lots of observations. That's for the ocean. For the land, it's a bit more complicated. You cannot use such simple methods as this one to extract maps of this land carbon sink. So we use some other methods. Uh, and one of the methods that we use uh, is the following. It's uh, what we call atmospheric inversions. Uh, so I was showing in the beginning only CO2 at Mauna Loa. Basically, implicitly, I was assuming that CO2 is well mixed in the atmosphere. But when you measure CO2 at different places, you have gradients in the atmosphere. <coughs> and so these atmospheric inversions, basically, they use atmospheric CO2 gradients to back up fluxes at the surface. So one simple example of that is if you measure CO2 on the east coast of the US, and if you measure CO2, for example, in Ireland here, you know that the winds are blowing from the east coast to Ireland. And if there is less CO2 in Ireland than on the east coast of the US, you can infer a flux to the ocean in between those two points. So that's basically the principle of the atmospheric inversion. So now we have atmospheric measurements of CO2 
in many, many places over the world. Here you see the, the, the global view uh, network of, of stations. And what we do is this inverse uh, methods. So you assume an a priori flux of CO2. You transport these fluxes with a transport model in the atmosphere. You compute concentrations. And then you will compare these concentrations to what you measure. And you will adjust the flux to get exactly what you measure. So basically, it's what's called, uh, it's why it's called inversions. You start from the atmospheric observations and you get flux inverting uh, a transport model, if you want. So with these kind of methods, you can reconstruct fluxes over the ocean, but over the land, regionally, in big regions, or even now in smaller and smaller regions. So we have now a more detailed view of the global carbon uh, sinks at the regional scale. And you have this, so we won't go into details, but you have these figures in the last IPCC reports. So you have estimated land sink in different big regions of the world here, and estimated ocean sink in also big regions of the ocean. And you have different methods here based on atmospheric inversions or based on uh, uh, extrapolation of local measurements that you can get in some regions. And we start to be more and more precise for these methods. In the ocean, we use also the, the maps that I was showing to start with. So we start to have a regional views of these fluxes to different regions of the world on a, of the ocean. I won't detail this. So now let me go briefly into explaining the processes uh, that drive these fluxes to the land biosphere and to the ocean. So why do we have a land sink and why do we have an ocean sink? So first, the land sink, I use this very simple uh, schematic from the third assessment report of the IPCC 2001, uh, in which you have uh, uh, gross, primary, gross primary production here, net primary production, autotrophic respiration, and heterotrophic respiration. So a net carbon sink to the land implies that you have a disequilibrium between uh, basically photosynthesis on that side and respiration. So to have a net sink, you need more photosynthesis than you have respiration, whether it's autotrophic and, and heterotrophic. So one way scientists have been explaining this land carbon sink for the past years and decades is based on what we call CO2 fertilization. So a CO2 fertilization effect would be the fact that we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, would fertilize the land biosphere, would increase photosynthesis here, GPP, at the uh, expense of respiration, and this would drive a net sink to the land biosphere. And this has been tested on the field. You have what are called phased experiments here, in which you take some uh, parcel of, uh, of a forest, and you will artificially enrich the atmosphere uh, with more CO2. And then you will, you will compare the biomass, for example, or the growth of trees that live in an enriched atmosphere compared to trees that lived in a normal atmosphere. And that's what you see here. So it's the net primary production uh, for the enriched uh, forests on that side. And this is for the con what we call control forests that grow under uh, present CO2. And you see that there is a a line here which slope is different from one uh, by something like 20%. So you have 20 more, 20% 20 more NPP in the enriched experiment than in the controlled experiment. So that may be causing part of the land sink. The fact that you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, all C3 plants, they would do more photosynthesis and then you would have an amplified sink in the land biosphere. So, so that would cause maybe part of the sink. But we have other factors that could play a role. And I just list them here. The fact that we have also more nitrogen in the atmosphere coming from fertilizers, coming from combustion, this nitrogen will be deposited onto the land ecosystems and could fertilize the ecosystem. And this could cause also some part of the sink. So anthropogenic nitrogen deposition. The fact that the climate is warming, that the growing season is expanding, that could also cause part of the land sink. And finally, land use changes, and especially what we call reforestation after deforestation that could also partly cause uh, some part of this uh, land sink. So we still don't know exactly how to attribute this uh, net land sink, CO2 fertilization, as compared to these other factors here. And some of these other factors are very difficult to model, especially land use changes, very difficult to model. It's very small scales. In global models, very difficult to do. So let's go to the ocean now. So you have the same map than before, but it's animated here. You see the different months of the year. And you see what you have here, basically, it's a picture of the natural carbon cycle. 
So you have places in which carbon enters the ocean and places where carbon uh, goes out of the ocean. And that's nothing to do with the anthropogenic carbon. That's the natural carbon cycle. So the natural carbon cycle is complicated already because you have basically transport of carbon in the ocean from these regions to these regions, etc., etc. And so that's a simple picture of the carbon cycle. You see it's complicated because you have physics, chemistry, and biology. So we won't go into details, but basically when CO2 is, is entering the ocean, it decomposes with, uh, with water here to give the uh, bicarbonate ions. Uh, and then you have all the biological processes, as we've seen for the land, uh, gross primary production by phytoplankton, autotrophic respiration, and then heterotrophic respiration, uh, phytoplankton grazed by zooplankton, etc., etc. And then, then you have a large role of physics also, because this water parcels here at the surface, they are mixed or they are advected by the currents brought to the deep ocean and then it's coming back. You have uprellings, etc., etc. So if we come back here on that maps, you have to use all these processes to explain what's happening in the natural carbon cycle. So for example here, in the equatorial uprelling regions, you have carbon enriched waters that are at the subsurface that will be brought to the surface with the uprelling and that's why you see this degassing of carbon to the atmosphere. So you need first to have enriched carbon at the subsurface due to the biology. So you brought carbon from the surface to the subsurface. You enrich these waters. And then these waters are brought back to the surface and they lose their carbon to the atmosphere. In these regions of the world, you have uptake of carbon because it's cool. So the solubility is high. So you take up CO2. And then also you form deep water. So you bring this carbon to the deep ocean. And in addition, you have phytoplankton blooms that will consume CO2 and it will be exported to the deep ocean. So to understand this picture, you need all these processes. But the anthropogenic sink, it's somehow simpler. And I just go here into detail. So this, I guess, Jim Orr will be showing that. When CO2 dissolves, it reacts with H2O and, and a carbonate ion to give bicarbonate ions here. Uh, and let me show just this picture. That's an estimation uh, on where we have anthropogenic carbon in the ocean today. So that's a small fraction of the total carbon we find in the ocean. So that's the vertical integrate, integrated anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. And you see that we find ca anthropogenic carbon mostly in the North Atlantic here, but also in the South Zone Ocean. Basically in the places where you form deep mud waters, intermediate waters. So it's like anthropogenic carbon is entering the ocean and then it's advected with the currents into the subsurface or into the deep oceans. So we can think uh, of anthropogenic carbon as something very simple. And I quote here what was already said in the IPCC 2001 report. Despite the importance of the biological processes for the ocean's natural cycle, that is what has been showing in the, in the previous figures, you know, you, you transfer carbon from the surface to the subsurface with the biology. It's very important for the natural carbon cycle. The, Oceanic uptake of anthropogenic CO2 is primarily a physically and chemically controlled process that is superimposed on this natural carbon cycle. So because it's cold here in the North Atlantic, you will dissolve lots of anthropogenic carbon with this delta PCO2 that I was showing before, and then you will transport this carbon to the deep ocean. And that explains why you have, yes? Very, very good question. You cannot distinguish. Those are the same molecules. So you, you, don't, you don't measure directly the anthropogenic carbon. So you need some methods, indirect methods, to extract the anthropogenic components from the total carbon. What you measure is the total carbon. So what we do is we reconstruct the anthropogenic part of this total carbon using, for example, some other tracers. So you can use tracers like CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that we know the history in the atmosphere. Those, those are uh, molecules that have been dissolving in the ocean and then transported by the currents. So if you measure CFCs in the ocean, you know basically the age of your water mass. And if you know the age of the water mass, you know the atmospheric CO2 at the time when the water mass was at the sea surface. And so you have an idea of the flux of anthropogenic carbon at the time when the water mass was at the sea surface. So using CFCs, using some other tracers, also you can reconstruct the anthropogenic carbon part. But you're right, we don't measure in the ocean, we don't measure the anthropogenic carbon, we have to reconstruct it. 
Okay, so then, so it's, those methods are complicated. In, so when you take a, a water parcel from the sea surface, uh, so it will be, because CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, it will be enriched in CO2, so taking up some anthropogenic carbon, and then it will be also enriched CFCs because CFCs are also increasing in the atmosphere. Okay, and then you follow this water parcel. Many things can occur. To CFCs, nothing will occur because it's chemically uh, inert. For CO2, you have lots of processes, biology and mixing with maybe other water masses. And so you have to reconstruct these, uh, for example, biological changes. So we'll, you will use some other tracers, like the nutrient, the oxygen, to reconstruct the biological changes to the water mass. And so if you're able to subtract the biological changes, then you're left with just the physical transports and mixing, and this would be the same than for CFCs. And so if you do that, you extract, so then you're able to extract the biological signal, you're able to extract the mixing signal in the ocean, and then you're left with the anthropogenic part that was taken from the atmosphere. So it's indirect methods, but there are many of them, and we try to combine them to get those kind of plots. But it's a good question. We don't measure directly anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. Okay, last part of the talk. Maybe I have five more minutes. Uh, climate carbon coupling. So far, I've been explaining the CO2 sink to the ocean and to the land without, almost apart maybe from the land, without climate change. So it's only because CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere, you have the CO2 fertilization effect on the land, and you have just excess of CO2 in the atmosphere that dissolved in the ocean for the ocean carbon sink. So we explain basically the CO2 sinks without any influence of a changing climate. But we have evidence from past records of links between the, the carbon system and the climate system. And you see here over interannual timescales, uh, the atmospheric CO2 growth rate that we've been looking at when comparing to CO2 emissions. And we said we have variability that we don't understand from emissions, so we have to explain them from something else. And you have a comparison between the atmospheric CO2 growth rate and the tropical land temperatures linked to El Nino variability. And what, so the CO2 growth rate is in green here, and the tropical temperatures are, are in uh, orange, and the black lines uh, are depicting uh, big El Ninos. And what you see here is that when you have strong El Ninos, oh, I don't have the years here, but that's, I guess this is uh, 91 Pinatubo, that's the 97 El Ninos here, that should be maybe 87. Uh, so 97 El Ninos, you have higher growth rate of atmospheric CO2 and also high temperatures over the tropical lands and a strong El Nino. And you see that many times over the last uh, decades. So there's a strong link between climate variability linked to ENSO, linked to El Nino, and the CO2 growth rate. And we explain this because when you have uh, increased temperature, maybe less humidity also over the land, the land uh, ecosystems will lose carbon to the atmosphere, much more these years than the previous years. And that explains this uh, annual growth rate of CO2. So you have a strong link between climate here and the growth rate of CO2 at the interannual scale. If you go at much longer time scales, you've seen those graphs, that's the atmospheric CO2 record, uh, that's the atmospheric CO2 recorded from ice cores over the last million of years. And that's the temperature deduced from del 18 or delta deuterium, as you've seen from uh, Thomas Bruni and Valérie Masson-Delmotte. And you see also this very strong correlation between atmospheric CO2 and the climate states over these time scales. And that's also a proof of the links between the climate system and the CO2 in the atmosphere. Climate is influencing CO2. In that case, it's not because of the land biosphere as it is for the internal variability. It's because of the ocean. In, during glacial times here, when it's very cold, the ocean is cooler. So the solubility is increased. CO2 will be stored a bit more in the ocean. You have then other processes, maybe iron fertilization, maybe changes in circulation due to climate change that will explain why CO2 is stored in the ocean. So strong link between CO2 and the climate states. And this basically uh, poses a question for the next uh, decades. If this coupling is active, how can you project the evolution of CO2 in the atmosphere without taking into account this coupling? And that's what you see here. That's the, the way we were doing projections before in IPCC 2007 and before. You have socioeconomic scenarios for emissions. You convert these emissions into concentrations, assuming that the things will remain more or less constant in terms of percentage. And then once you have concentrations, you use climate models to project uh, the evolution of climate based on the different scenarios. And the coupling that I'm talking about now 
is the following. If climate is influencing the carbon sinks, then you have a potential retraction, a, a potential loop here that can be positive or negative. So maybe I won't go into too much details if I want to keep some time, but there's been this uh, paper in 2000 in Nature with a model coupling the climate system and the carbon system. And they were showing basically that if you take into account this coupled retraction, it's a positive feedback loop. And CO2 increase much more rapidly in the atmosphere if you take into account the carbon cycle feedbacks uh, due to climate change. And in that case, because of climate change, Amazon uh, vegetation was decreasing. They were simulating an Amazon dieback, and then CO2 was increasing much more. And now, this is something we take into account in the new projections that you've seen presented by Thomas Stoker. So we take into account this couple system, and that's uh, the processes responsible for the uh, coupling between carbon and climate. That's how we project uh, this influence of the coupling on what we call compatible fossil fuel emissions. I can come back to that in questions. And I will finish here with just this slide of conclusion. We've been talking about the next decades up to maybe 2100, and the last decades, the last 50 years mostly. And that's something that Annie also mentioned in her talk. The CO2 that will emit in the atmosphere will remain long after uh, emissions in the, in the atmosphere. And here you have an idealized simulation in which you have a pulse of CO2 in the atmosphere. We've been talking about this first part. Land and ocean are absorbing part of this CO2. If you wait 100 years, half of the CO2 will be absorbed by the ocean and by the land. Still half remains in the atmosphere. Then you have to wait 1,000 years to go to maybe 25%. And that will be due to ocean invasion. That's the time scale of the ocean mixing. So that's your 25%. And then even if you wait 10,000 years, so you have other processes, the reaction with the sediments, that will help absorbing more CO2 into the ocean, you still have maybe 20% of CO2 remaining in the atmosphere after 10,000 of years. And if you want to basically remove all this CO2, you have to wait millions of years, and that's the geological carbon cycle. Weathering of silicates on the continents will absorb the remaining CO2 and then go to the ocean and uh, formation of carbonate. Okay, so I stop here with this uh, last figure. Thank you. <laughs>